at this point, it's the weird thing of finding that I've painted almost every major Marvel character I could think of. Um, so there's a very few that I've yet to touch on. Like, when I eventually do a painting of Apocalypse, it'll be the first time I've ever done one of him, I think. I think. Um, I, you know, figure whether or not I like it from being part of the era, which isn't so much my youth, but the main fan base of comics now, younger men than myself, you know, I did Venom, and I don't necessarily love the anti-hero types like Venom as much because they kind of overtook the comic scene for a good long time back in the 90s. But, you know, because he's such an organic kind of physically um, dynamic character in terms of being this exaggerated muscular body, it turns out to be one of the better paintings I've done for this group of pieces so far, which sucks because I don't like him. And the thing is, in the comics, he was not necessarily supposed to be, like, Hulk-sized. It's just that the legend of the character kind of grew with his popularity. So the guy that gets this symbiote put on him after it had been on Spider-Man, he's a bigger guy than Spider-Man. But he's not supposed to be abnormal. He's just bigger. And so then the effect is supposed to be different. And then, of course, the way that uh, the symbiote works with this other guy is he now has an open mouth in the mask instead of it being a closed mask like Spider-Man had. Um, and therefore you get this talking, interactive character that shows the personality of the symbiote and blah blah blah. Over time, people loved that so much that he became more this distinctive personality that, you know, sort of demanded he grow in grandeur and size. And so he goes from being human size to then being you know, more monstrous Hulk size. And I, picking what I was doing, I was trying to represent the earliest version of it more to do with the uh, the way it was designed by Todd McFarlane. Um, being true to that while also, you know, incorporating a certain amount of the, the height and scale that he would seem to be. There is action figures made by Marvel in the last 20 years that have pretty much represented every single major villain that I could use as a point of reference. So I take one part photo of myself doing the quick pose to make it kind of more natural in terms of what things the human body can kind of stand and do, what looks normal coming from the way the human hands look, and, and then mix it with the reference I learned from looking at a photo of a toy where the, uh, the lighting on the particulars of the skin, the clothing, the accoutrements of the character is illuminated through the action figure. But, you know, you need the humanity mixed with that, so combining the two things together is my way of arriving at the final thing. And uh, Doctor Doom was one where I've got a bunch of action figures, I got a larger doll of him, I've got a head bust that uh, I designed that was used and photographed each one of these things kind of putting into one hopper of blending it all together to make the final painting um, and wanting to make sure that he kind of comes across as cool as I can possibly try and make him seem. Um, the complication with a character like him is that you know it all comes down to balance of elements of you know the way that you render the the sort of armor he wears or the um, the exact shape of the details of his helmet each one of those things being sort of a delicate thing to get right I mean Dr. Doom is the sort of center of Marvel's villain universe and he's not Spider-Man's nemesis in the same way that uh, you know, Green Goblin is pretty focused only on Spider-Man. He doesn't go around mixing it up with other superheroes. But um, Doctor Doom has been a problem for pretty much everybody, but he comes from being primarily the Fantastic Four's main nemesis. And um, But he's distinctive and unique in the fact that 
they made him kind of untouchable in the Marvel Universe by saying him, uh, making him the leader of a European nation, a fictional one, but you know, that basically making the idea that, yeah, he has diplomatic immunity and, you know, you could defeat him, but you couldn't arrest him. <laughs> You couldn't do anything about this guy because of the way the laws work for, you know, foreign diplomats. I guess you could just get him kicked out of the country for a while, even if he's done something that, I don't know, caused the deaths of how many people, I don't know. You know, I'm not intentionally looking to make every comic thing sort of like what happens in the movies now, where they dilute color to the point of it being dull or dark because that'll seem somehow more real but there there are choices like that being made where the vibrant colors of the comics aren't always necessarily what instinctively i as a fan think that was intellectually intended that it happened but it wasn't it wasn't necessarily the only defining thing of the character that you you have to sort of take that with a certain judgment and say, okay, this character wearing these vibrant colors here is not really what they were wearing. You know, that you you have only so many colors available in the palette of the way comics were created for much of its history. Uh, comics had a very limited four-color process. So somebody like Dr. Doom has a green cloak and tunic on top of his gray metal armor. You've got the possibility of making armor looking very shiny and bright, you know, a brighter silver or a duller kind of gun metal. And in his case, he doesn't seem like he would be looking for his armor to somehow seem it's both regal and functional with the purpose of not being showy. It's more like he's meant to look scary, but he's not meant to be like, look at my fancy appearance. So his exact color choices would be more subdued so that actually the green he's wearing can get very dark and deep. I could almost imagine it coming close to black in some ways. And, uh, and the gray of the armor is, again, not meant to be vibrant or beautiful. It's actually meant to look somewhat like an old suit of armor. And the earliest drawings that were done of his suits um, really play into that where it really isn't a very techy version of a suit so um, he has mostly details in common with real historical suits of armor from European history.